This lecture is on nationalism outside of Russia. As you remember, the Russian Five were very, very important uh, composers that championed the Russian idioms through their legends, dances, um, various uh, historical um, events. And we're gonna notice that other countries decided that they also wanted to do the same. They wanted to spotlight their countries through nationalistic instruments, places, tales, heroes. And so we're gonna go through various countries to show you the various uh, composers that take this as their charge of creating works that are very nationalistic in flavor. We're gonna start with the Bohemian country. Uh, and since Czech, uh, Czechoslovakia as a country was not created until 1918, we're gonna call them the Bohemian composers. And they, the two Bohemian composers are Antoine Dvorak and um, Bedrik Smetna. I'm gonna start with Dvorak. Uh, a couple of details about Dvorak. Um, his dates are 1841 to 1904. And he is a Bohemian composer. And he created these Slavonic dances. You're gonna be listening to the first one. They are in two sets. They're 16 multi-mooded, multi-colored symphonic pieces. And they're divided into two sets of eight. But they were originally composed for four hands at one piano. You're going to be listening to the first one, which is known as the Fouriant. It's in C. It's a Czech swagger dance. So you'll notice that you can almost envision the dancing element of it, even though they are just um, orchestral pieces. You'll notice the use of modal melodies, um, flatted seventh scale degrees, and his um, vocabulary of his melodic structure. He really didn't um, take a specific folk tune and incorporate it, but he just gives you the sense that he creates the spirit of the folk, the Bohemian folk tune. You'll notice at the very beginning of the Czech Swagger dance, you have the sense that they're actually bowing to each other. The other composer is Bedrik Smetna, dates 1824 to 1884. Uh, and his nationalism actually is not with dances per se, but he wrote this cycle of symphonic poems called Mav Lost, My Country. And they, in 1874, what he does is, is he actually takes aspects of his country, ge geographic ideas, locations, um, and he puts them into these symphonic poems. The one that I would like you to be able to recognize and actually to listen to is the Moldau, or the river known as Voltava. This is a great river in Bohemia, it does exist, and um, he actually has a program so that when you're listening to it, you have this sense of how the river actually is formed with the two springs gushing from the shade of the Bohemian forest, one warm and spouting, the other cool and tranquil. There are, then we have this rushing over rocky beds until they unite. And then we have the very famous River Voltava or the Moldau. You're gonna notice that it'll flow through the woods. You'll hear the hunter's horn. You'll witness a wedding feast. And finally, you'll get to St. John's Rapids where the streams, there's rapid streams rushing um, onwards as it moves, the river moves to Prague. And finally, you'll envision this fortress as the river fades into the distance. What's interesting about the Mavlost in 1874, he, he actually created these six symphonic poems at the age of 50. He had an oral disorder um, where he had this hearing of a sustained high pitch note all the time. And when he was actually composing the, the symphonic poems of Mavlost, he became totally deaf. So the one that I would like you to hear, listen to is the uh, Moldau, and it's the Voltava, and it is on the uh, listening list. 
Now we're going to go to Finland. Finland's composer, nationalistic composer, is Jean Sibelius. In fact, he wrote, in fact, the anthem for Finland. It comes from his uh, work itself, which is Finlandia, and it is a tune that is even been, has been used in the church where they've used the uh, same tune, but they have changed the words. But um, so he's famous for it, the national anthem of Finland, writing the, the national anthem of Finland, <coughs> Finlandia. But he's also, uh, he takes the Kalevala, which is Finnish mythological tales, and he puts them into music. The storyline is, is that in Finland, um, if you were growing up, you would know about Lemminkainen. Lemminkainen was uh, like the hero, the Finnish hero. And in order for him to get the hand of a beautiful a daughter, uh, Poja, he had to capture on snowshoes, um, the elk, he had to shoot the swan of Tuonela with one arrow, and he had to harness fire-breathing steeds, and then he would get the girl. Um, in carrying out these tasks, <clears throat> the story is, is that in the Kalevala we hear that Lemminkainen is slain, he's carried down the river to Tuonela where his body is all carved up, but his mother, hearing of, his son's, hearing of her son's death, she being a sorceress, seeks him out and by magic art restores him to life like a resurrection figure. The one work that you're gonna to listen to here is the Swan of Tuonela. The Swan of Tuonela, the programmatic storyline is Tuonela, the land of death, the hell of Finnish mythology is surrounded by a large river with black waters and a rapid current on which the swan of Tuonela floats ma majestically singing. You're gonna notice that he uses the English horn as the swan. And you're also gonna know, please note the subdivision of the strings um, into more than a dozen parts. It gives you that sense of the shimmer or the aura around the swan. It's a very beautiful work that mirrors where Lemminkainen would have to go and actually kill the swan uh, as part of the feats. And that takes us to Norway with Edvard Grieg. Now he, um, his work is actually the very famous Peer Gint, but you'll probably know the one part that I'm asking you to listen to from all of the cartoons and all of the um, commercials that have used it, and that's In the Hall of the Mountain King. It was created in 1876, Edvard Grieg's dates are 1843 to 1907. These, this Peer Gint, of course, a um, little different kind of character than Lemon Canaan from, uh, 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 from Finnish um, tales, and that's because Peer Gint is kind of like a, a lazy person, and he's trying to always live off the fat of the land, and what happens is one of his first acts that he does is, is that he abducts a bride where he's at the wedding and he abducts the bride. And then of course he becomes an outlaw and then he kind of on this travels. He goes and meets up with the trolls and this is where um, In the Hall of the Mountain King um, actually takes place in the storyline. And then he continues on and unfortunately he does fall in love with um, Anitra and what happens is, is that um, all of his possessions are taken away from him, and there's, there, he's robbed. Finally, he decides he's going to come home. And when he comes home, there is this woman that's been waiting for him, Soldig, um, for all the, the, the time that he's been on this journey. When a uh, Greek composed in the Hall of the Mountain King as an interlude for Ibsen's 1867 play, Peer Gint. And it's known as an orchestral piece. Um, it's part of the Peer Gint suite. But there's a choral version 
where the lyrics come from, the trolls are completely surround the main character, Pierre Gint, at this point. And you gotta remember, in the Hall of the Mountain King, um, Daddy Troll is being introduced to Pierre Gint because supposedly he's thinking, Pierre Gint's thinking of possibly wedding uh, the daughter of the king. And then he has second thoughts about it and you can sense that when you listen to In the Hall of the Mountain King. But what's interesting about the choral version of this is, is that the trolls actually are um, pretty vicious and the translation of the words if you do listen to the version that I do have on the listening list the version is and you can picture these trolls like screaming at him slay him the Christian man's son has seduced the fairest maid of the mountain king slay him may I hack him on the fingers may I tug him by the hair let me bite him in the haunches um, Let's put him into broth. Um, shall he roast on a spit or be browned in a stew pan? Ice to your blood, friends. So as you can see, he's kind of like, uh, these trolls become a little monstrous. And I think that's the reason why Pierre Gint thinks maybe he should go on with his journeys. So I'm sure you will enjoy In the Hall of the Mountain King, which is basically one tune that continues throughout the entire work and is uh, changes along um, but it's by not by the melody but what um, Edvard Grieg does with that tune. And that takes us to Manuel de Falla in Spain 1876 to 1946. The very famous ballet, El Amor Brujo, 1915, um, is the example I'm going to be using. I'm going to be using the very famous uh, ritual fire dance, which you can actually see as a visualization, so you can actually see the dance itself on YouTube. Defaya said, when he was very nationalistic, our music must be based on the natural music of our people, on the dances and songs that do not always show uh, close kinship. In our dance and in our rhythms, we possess the strongest of traditions that none can obliterate. In this ballet, the storyline you have of uh, Candela, um, it's a story of an Andalusian gypsy woman, and Candela is that gypsy woman, and although she has affection, um, although her affection is for a man named Carmelo, as a girl she's promised to marry another man. After many years, Candela's husband has died at the hands of the husband of a woman named Lucia, but he continues to haunt his wife. So Candela cannot get rid of him. He's like the ghost husband. So Candela dances every night with her husband's ghost, but then she comes to realize her husband was unfaithful, and guess who with? Lucia. But the ghost is still obs uh, obsessed with Candela's soul, and, and because of that, Carmela, who was really the man um, that maybe Candela really wanted to marry initially, cannot be with her. So Candela dances initially with her husband's ghost, and at the last moment, Candela moves away from her husband, throws Lucia in, so she is taken by her dead lover. The, re the religious ceremony of the fire dance is used to worship the fire god, and the people would of often jump through or leap through the fire. So that's the ritual fire dance that you're going to be listening to. And um, Candela performs this ritual fire dance, and the ghost of her husband appears, and they dance. And as they roll faster and faster, the ghost is drawn into the fire. So again, the ballet meaning that it is all done with uh, pretty much with gestures, that the va ballet is based on this getting rid of the ghost husband so that Candela can continue to love Carmel. The Ritual Fire Dance by Manuel de Falla. And last but not least, I wanted to add um, a 
the, one of the first American nationalists, and that is Louis Gottschalk, 1829 to 1869, from New Orleans. He was exposed to African uh, Caribbean uh, rhythms. One of his famous uh, nationalistic pieces is The Union, which is a compilation of patriotic tunes. But there is also another work, and it um, was initially for piano. Um, it's been transcribed for other, uh, for other instruments, but the, it was called The Banjo, and it was composed in 1853. Um, and it really is based on that pre-Civil War Afro-American banjo playing. And when you're listening to this, and you'll have to listen to this on YouTube, um, it includes at the end Camp Town Races, which is a tune of Stephen Foster's, 1826, who was uh, a, a composer, 1826 to 1864. And this work, the banjo, was actually performed in 1855 by the composer. You will definitely enjoy the Banjo by Louis Gottschalk. It's a great example of nationalism in America. 